Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Traction.gg podcast where we talk about racing games, esports and sim racing. And today we're actually going to be talking about sim rallying more specifically because we are joined by a three-time British rally champion. It's none other than Matt Edwards. How are you doing, Matt? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really good, thank you. And thank you very much for joining our podcast to talk about uh, some real-world rallying and the virtual world. And I think you are an excellent guest to get on board to discuss the differences between the two, how they can uh, overlap, but also how the sim world can improve. Uh, but first of all, we have a lot of uh, sim racing listeners, and I'd like to explain exactly you know, who you are and what you do. Obviously, you are a three-time British Rally Champion, so you won the titles in 2018, 2019, and of course, 2021. We're just recording this after you just won the Ulster Rally. Congratulations. How was that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, roller coaster of emotions. Um... Fairly intense, uh, but yeah, we, we we came through in the end. So yeah, I'm really happy. Yeah, amazing result. And I should also add, just for fun, you also won the BTRDA Gold Star Championship in 2018 as well, alongside the BRC, and you are the BRC Two Champion from 2016 in a, in a classic Group N Mitsubishi. Love to see those cars around. Been well informed. I'm quite impressed. Oh well, the, yeah, <laughs> EWRC is an amazing resource. Now, I, obviously, um, yeah, I, I'm a personally, I'm a big rally nerd as well. So um, it's all good. So, uh, but first of all, before we jump into the big uh, championship successes, I'd just like to know a little bit about your background. You know, how did you get into rallying, first of all, if that's okay? Um, well, my father is clerk of the course of the Cambrian Rally in North Wales, and he competed. Uh, he was competing while I was, while I was very young. Um, so there was always an interest there. Um, but I actually started in 2004 in a, a self-built Mark II Astra that I'd Built a little bit on the quiet um, from everybody uh, while well, I had a gap year before I went to uni uh, and then just started doing club and level rallying, uh, BTRDA 1400s and, and sort of worked my way up bit by bit. Very difficult um, sort of sport to make headway in unless you've got right. a, a fortune to start with. Um, so unfortunately, without that advantage, it was, it's, it, you know, it's taken a long time. Um, built the support and the... the um, sponsors and the, you know the team around me over the last 18 years now so it's it's taken a wow. long time the last the last four of which uh five of which is, as you say have been in the british rally championship so um it's it's taken a long time in motorsport terms to get to get this far but it's more a lack of funding than ambition that's for sure and it's yeah. as a result of the weekend it's still nice to feel that that ambition and that motivation is there you know after so many years to, to carry on to. Amazing. So uh, while everyone else was uh, traveling around Europe on their gap year, you were tinkering with the Vauxhall Astra. And, yeah. and this is yeah. what <laughs> works out in the end. Yeah. I wish I'd have done that. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite funny because I, I, I don't know why I picked Mark II Astra. I think there was something about the old um, late 80s British Championship videos that I've, I've still got on the shelf here that I watch. Um, Something about the Mark II Astra I, I liked, and I drove one as a road car. My first road car was a Mark II Astra, and I basically built the the rally car into the road car whilst the shell was getting sort of tidied up and ready. And then when when all the, the shell was ready to build the actual rally car from, I put all the engine, the gearbox, the seats, the belts, and all the rest of it off the road car onto the rally car and scrapped the shell. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that, that was kind <laughs> of the, the, the way that materialised. Oh, that's... That's cool. That's a real uh, grassroots approach and story that you can be successful if you put the hard hard graft in. Uh, yeah. Any yeah. apart from the Astra, any uh, any cars along the way? Because you've got a really varied uh, car rally history. Uh, any yeah. that also like uh, you know you remember fondly? Um, I, I remember them all. They've all got stories <laughs> to tell. You know, right. built, uh, not long after the Astra, we built a, a Fiesta ST for the the M Sport. Sport Trophy, yeah, ST Sport Trophy, and I built that in a three-sided barn in the freezing cold winter in 2008. Uh, we came second in that championship to Craig Breen. Again, budgets world apart, you know, same tyres, two rallies in a row and all that sort of thing, and we still managed to have success with that and then managed to get a go in four-wheel drive cars, uh, you know, uh, Mitsubishi Evos that, again, self-built, self-maintained. Um but you know, a special car was the the, the Mitsubishi we did um, BRC in in 2016. Yeah, that was, that was it. It was a, a a totally legitimate Group N car, but it was one of the best cars I'd ever driven. Really, in terms of okay, it was a big heavy car, but 
it was built in six weeks, night and day. Wow. From, from a very, very fresh import. Um, and that that car was was gorgeous. It just felt it felt like an armchair to drive it. You know, the latest Riker <laughs> suspension and you know the, the dog box was was you know brand new. And it was the first time I had a proper brand new car really. Uh, so that that was a good experience. Although it wasn't the fastest car in the rally, it was for me. It was a very refined car that, that felt awesome to drive and you know it looked good as well. Well, sometimes it's not just about the outright speed. It's about the poise and the handling and yeah. how comfortable you feel, right? And yeah, that exactly. must have been pretty special to take it to the BRC two title that season. And then I think that was was that a, is it fair to say that was a stepping stone to try and get into the the R five car the next year? Yeah, well, th- there was a bit of a story behind how that 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 materialised because at that time Max Vatten and uh, Ari Vatten and son was to be driving a an R five in a in a DMAC uh, livery car DMAC team and we were sort of earmarked for the second seat with that. And there was going to be a bit of a shootout with like a, a fitness test and all the rest of it to, to establish who would get that second seat. And I'd had an accident the previous year and, you know, I, I don't know, you know, physically I, I was quite battered, um, but we went, we were going to go for the shootout and got fit and all the rest of it after the accident and trained. And um, then all of a sudden Elvin Evans with, was without a seat in the world championship. Uh, and he was put in that car to develop the Fiesta the tires and all the rest of it. So that was that was that opportunity gone. And they said, right, well, what do we do next? And you know, it was like we'll, we'll go and we'll go and we'll, we'll we'll buy an Evo and go and do the the, the BRC two championship. Uh, and it was like, well, it's a long time since anyone really competitively ran a genuine Group N car. A lot of them changed the restrictors or or various, you know, put sequential gearbox in it, which takes it out of that category. So we had to we had to build one to be sure that we were getting something that was genuine and legal for the, you know, because it's only it only takes right. little things for it to fall out of that that category. So we built well I we I and a couple of people built it in six weeks before the start of the championship and went to the first round in Mid Wales and and we I think we were fourth overall after the first night in the snow and ice in Meherin. It was that was that sort of put us on the map in the British Championship because that was my first stage in the the overall category of the British Championship. So it was right. it was great to be in amongst the R five cars straight away. Yeah, that was mad because the entry list in the R five category was extremely competitive that year as well, yeah. right? That's and right. So that's to, to punch up a view, it was pretty impressive. That sort of paved the way. Then yeah, um, we were sort of on the on the radar for with the R five cars, and it was at that point uh, a long term sponsor in in Pete Smith of the Swift group took it to the board and said, we need this lad in, a, in an R5 car. And nice. that materialised much to my surprise and relief, if you like, at yeah. the end of that year. And we did the last two events of the year in that car, Ulster and the Isle of Man. So special year. Yeah, incredible. And it's a real good, um, really amazing story. And it, I remember watching the BRC that year. It was a really big year for the championship and you definitely stood out. And then... Uh, next season, you came third in the R5, and then the year after that, uh, you won your first British Rally Championship. Uh, just talk me through the emotions. You know, what did it feel like to to win that uh, historic and well known title? It, it again that that started. It was a project that started at the end of 2016 with those two two events in the R5, uh, Ulster and the Alaman. And although we were top five quite quickly, we finished fifth on the Manx. Um, it was clear that. The gap to the, the, the to first was quite a lot in terms of time. So, twenty seventeen was always going to be like a learning year. We run the car sort of privately, um, got some really good results, got a couple of fastest stage times, particularly on tarmac. Um, so we went into eighteen as the, like the number one M Sport driver, if you like, um, run by M Sport. It brought with it a lot more testing, a lot more time in the car, and then we ran a privately owned car in BTRDA alongside it. So it was, you know, I wouldn't say every other week, but I, w- I was never long out of the car. Right, uh, a lot of seat times. Was, and, and in those cars, that is that is the key to it. So, you know, we won the first round at the Pirelli and uh, we won the Rally Nut stages, which was the second round of the BTRDA. And I think we, we pretty much won everything that year that we that we started. And that, that was a huge year. Um, and to win the British title was, you know, was something I I dreamed of, always wanted to do. Um, 
the British Championship has always been something I've been involved with or interested in and um, a bit of an anorak in terms of the, the history of that and the, the, the iconic drivers that have won it and, and the, the events, you know, that they are very important to a lot of people. So to actually have my name on the DVD and the picture on the front cover, Ben will remember that. Getting the uh, the the front cover sorted, you know, I had the choice of the photos and that, which was great. And, uh, yeah. Oh, that's a moment. That's that one. Yeah, that's a real moment. Yeah, I certainly had a lot of those DVDs and VHSs actually yeah, growing exactly. up. Yeah, they're still here. Yeah, nice. Um, so going into 2019, obviously, in the end, you, you won your second title, which was amazing. Was there more pressure to to back up the 2018 result? Uh, only from myself, I think. Um, right. Tom Tom Cave. But um, you know, a lot of pressure on that year. It was fast. Um, it was good to have somebody of his caliber in, you know, as well. Because okay, there only ended up being <clears throat> myself and him really battling for the title. But as could be seen from like results on Rally GB, you know, he won he won the category on Rally GB that year. Uh, it just shows the level that the championship is at. And it, I've always said it, it only takes two people to have a race, and it doesn't matter how big the gap between second and third is. If there's tense between first and second, it just keeps pushing every, pushing you on. And just because there's only two of you doesn't mean you're on the limit or not, if not over it, which um, turned out to be the case for Tom in Ulster. Uh, ironically, on the same stage, the same time of the event that this championship materialised for me. So um, it was very intense. You know, again, there's a lot of a lot of ups and downs in the air, but um, you know, we we held on nerve and good consistent year when we won the title again nice yeah well we'll we'll jump about well we'll actually we'll go to this year's championship then because 2020 obviously we did one brc round you won it but then the season was unfortunately cancelled due to the the terrible covid19 pandemic so there wasn't a champion uh but 2021 uh back in the polo this time a, a new vehicle for yourself um, you ultimately won your third title. Amazing result. Congratulations. Uh, it was a, a big battle with Osh and Price all through the year and it, it culminated in the Ulster Rally, which at the time of recording was was just a few days ago. Yeah, uh, it, w- it was a big a big thing, this one. Um, as I said, the, this third title had never been done before in a row and that, that fact was, was pointed out at the end of 2019. So we've had to sustain involvement of all the right you've been waiting a long to. time <laughs> yeah yeah and i thought yes we're off and running in 2020 it's on and then all of a sudden that stopped and will we ever get the chance to do it and then when rallying was coming back you know is everybody still on board um you know budgets were changing chopping about are we going to get any budget uh and then obviously adapting to a different car it, it came relatively easy but it was always a a question mark until until we, we got in it you know it was a long time before we got in it um, you know, it was probably six months of having the deal on the table before we drove the car for, for various reasons. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of testing nor budget for it. So, um, but yeah, some some battle all year. Um, you know, a, a, probably the most varied season I've had in terms of ups and downs. Um, you know, mechanical problem, uh, a mistake by myself and then a Cambrian rally to forget um, in my backyard. <laughs> um, Happens sometimes to the best of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it was, it was a tough year, and you know, to battle back in Mole and the Cambrian, you know, with repairs to the car on the fly, if you like. Um, but it, it just always felt like it was still achievable. You know, even even when we were parked at the side of the road in on the Cambrian, I just took took a step back for a second and thought, right, this thing's a mess. How do we? What have we got? How do we get this thing to the finish? It just, I don't know. You almost just let it's like second nature take over. Try not to panic. Um, and we, we got the car around, got good points again, and it set up Ulster. And knowing that we just had to win Ulster, I say just win. That sounds it's an easier said than done, but right. Very challenging the asphalt rally for those who don't know in Northern yeah. Ireland. <laughs> it was um it it almost made everything a lot more simple than other connotations of Austrian's results. And uh it just meant there was one focus and I, I felt I felt that made my job a little bit easier and, you know, I knew I, knew I could sort of handle the, the situation because I've, I've been there before and I always believe that I, I can make these things happen when, when we need to. So. Well, certainly again, uh, congratulations to you and Darren Garrod, co-driver for the, 
this uh, championship. It was certainly a very exciting British Rally Championship season from where I was sat. Good. Many ups and downs. So, uh, and that's what you want to see as a fan for the championship, right? To go down to the wire and be yeah. a good battle. And that's why we do it as well. That's the, the competition and that, that thrill and that excitement is why we do it. You know, driving the car is one thing, but yeah, to actually drive it and be that close and that competitive with somebody else is, is another thing again. Yeah, absolutely uh, superb. Uh, I want to talk about driver training, if that's okay, because I know you do a, a lot of that. Is that fair to say? Is it yeah, is it rewarding for you to see newer drivers or younger drivers come through and improve based upon your tuition? Yeah, that's that's again that's the motivation for doing that. It's, it's that's my job satisfaction. For, you know, that's that's what I do for a living um, all over the world. Uh, it's it's a, it's a, it's very interesting to see how how different people approach the same thing. You know, it's uh, there's a lot of different ways to drive a car, and you know I, I find it really rewarding helping people adapt their style improve what they do and their understanding and you know as much as the young drivers it's the, the older generation you know the amount of people that have been rallying 20 30 years that that come for help in these new cars because you know that's the car they, they, they're driving and they're, they're very good drivers but it takes some adaption and understanding to drive these new cars quick so i get a lot out of you know helping everybody go go that bit faster and enjoying the rallying and you know it, it maximizes their performance um in a shorter space of time than you know, rallying the car for three years without the input. Right. That's, that's what a lot of people tend to find. It just accelerates the, the learning process and how quickly they can get to their potential. So um, yeah, that's that's really interesting and it's enjoyable, yeah. Yeah, I, I find that side of uh, Mudspot fascinating. It's often, you don't see big headlines about the driver training uh, going into it, uh, into like a big result, but it is a, it's a hugely important part of the process. Do, do you think that maybe in the future, if... Uh, the virtual world and rally sims improve that that will become part of the training process or are they already or they're not quite there yet? What, what's your thoughts on that it could be um the, the difference for me is the rally stages don't replicate the real life stages whereas the I tracks are, uh, are easy not easy but the tracks replicate the real life tracks um I guess with the graph, I don't understand necessarily how they do replicate them, but you know the the forests, the forests change uh, as well. Um, the routes change, the road conditions change, and I think it's that feeling of the different roads and the different I conditions, of the feeling in your in your body that that varies is why rallying's driving skill is more about uh, having a, a set of skills that you can adapt to any situation very quickly, rather than a rehearsed rehearsed driving style if that makes sense whereas like on on the sims for tracks you can rehearse what gear you're going to be in what speed and you know everything it's easy to replicate so you know you can drive you can drive a gravel road once and then 10 minutes later it's completely different because the degradation of the road the weather and you know it, a gravel road is different every time you go over it so, that's, a, that's a really key point that perhaps i'd overlooked yeah because especially if you're doing circuit racing sim racing let's say it's a dry Okay, temperatures can change and ambient and the amount of rubber on the track. But generally speaking, you're going uh, around, you know, ten to twenty corners. They're the same every lap, and it, there's only slight variances. Okay, it can rain as well, right? But to model that into a game is a lot of work. But also on a rally, you've got so many more kilometers of point to point action. There can be asphalt rallies. It can be wet. It can be dry. On the gravel, like you say, as more cars go over it, the line might what they call what we call clean which changes yeah. the grip level and how you adapt the car setup and your driving style to that is yeah. yeah that's a good really good point is i don't think we've got to a point in sim rally where where the change of grip is perhaps replicated exactly yeah uh day rally gets there to some to some degree for sure but um i think the biggest thing for me is that the sensation is getting the sensation in your body of what the car is doing that's really where most of my driver tuition focuses on is learning to feel what the car's doing because because of the change in grip and often you're on gravel or you know it's those forces in the car that you're trying to use the feeling of those is what you're trying to use to to go faster not a rehearsed plan of how you're going to go around a track um you, you're totally reliant on the, the whatever feeling the car on the surface that you approach at that one point and being able to do something with the car accordingly that you're not going to know about until you get there. 
Are, are there any elements at all that, that perhaps transfer? I was thinking along the lines of um, the concentration or if someone's never, okay, the pace notes in rail rallying are much more in depth than in a game, but uh, at least it perhaps trains you into trying to listen to them. Uh, there's like, I guess there's some perhaps basics that transfer across. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. And that's that's the predominant reason why I invested in in some equipment to to be able to do it a little bit more realistically, if you like. Listening to the co-driver, even if you know the stage, listening to the co-driver and transferring that information onto into your driving is is a you know a vital part of rallying. And that's that's again the difference between the circuit racing and the rallying is having the co-driver and the, the not necessarily knowing where you're going. So you have to learn to drive in a way that, and that enables you to listen to the pace notes as well as observe what to do with the car on the road ahead. It's quite difficult to explain, but you, you need to be able to feel the car, like I say, to, to do that. But listening to the notes and the rhythm that you get, yeah. it's probably the only real um, thing that transfers across and the assessment of the risk, which I think is what slows me down on the game because I'm always driving in a way that, is the way I would drive a, on, on a real rally. Yeah. So the, the consequences are slightly different. <laughs> yeah, the consequence is the word, yeah. There's, there's no consequences on the game other than reset. Yeah. Um, or getting booted out of the, you know, terminal damage. You know, yeah, the consequences are, okay, I'm going to have a cup of coffee now. Yeah, I'm it's not, not as expensive. I'm not stranded in the woods for five <laughs> hours. And, um, but yeah, I think, I think that's, you know, the, the help for me was just keeping sharp. And obviously you, yeah. you're turning the wheel and pressing the pedals in a similar way, but what it doesn't give you is the sensation of driving the car and the sensation to be. Yeah, I really hope that things uh, I've come things have come a long way actually in the last few years for me in terms of uh, the perceived sense of realism with sim rallying, but I'm also aware that there is a long way to go as well. I, I do believe that um, technology is always improving, so let's, let's hope it, it steps on. Uh, there are things like, so I see... Uh, Louise Cook was doing some crazy stuff on a full motion rig. And so I'm interested to see how that technology develops in the next few years and yeah. VR as well. There's all sorts we can do. On your side, in terms of the virtual rallying world, have you been getting into this, you know, maybe the last couple of years more than ever? Yeah, I mean, particularly since COVID, really. That, yeah, it was always been a passing interest, but nothing nothing that was that was ever really part of my day to day. Well, it's it's still probably not part of my day to day now that rallying real rallying's come back, but it's certainly, you know, it's there. It's it's good fun and it's it's entertaining and it's a bit of it's a bit of help in terms of keeping sharp for for when I go rallying. But for improvements going forward, it for me it's little details like the procedural things of going through a rally, you know, when you can change a puncture, when you can't, you know, like the on a rally, you can always get out and change the little damper clicks yourself, whereas on the game, you can't do that until you get back to service. Yeah, that's a good point. Elements of things that you can do at any time, you know, like like I say, and uh, little setup changes like that, little uh, things during the stage that, you know, may or may not happen, you know, the way the stages are set up, you know, the little arrows at the side of the road don't normally cause the car to roll over. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> you know, you know, little things like that, <laughs> that that can be quite frustrating and uh, uh, you know the interior you know I, I love the fact that the, the noise at the sound of the cars has come along a long way uh, that's yeah. that's you know part of the real realism and I, i'll never forget one of the, the previous dirt titles the, the interior of the fiesta they had the they had it on the road screen rather than the stage screen oh and a little the, digital dashboard right digital dashboard that's the stage that's the road road ah, mode interesting. screen but on the on the stage mode screen, you just get one big digit with your, your gear in it. So there's just little things like that. That that's the sort of thing a real rally driver would pick up, and someone yeah, like me exactly. wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That, so there's a, there's a few things like that, and uh, you know, the game's the game. I mean, I I wouldn't even be bothered about having road sections in it if you want. You know, a mode where you could literally go through a rally in a, a realistic time frame as well. You know, oh, you okay? Maybe not make them half an hour, forty minutes long, but you, you do it's have to. <laughs> You do actually have to get the car, rather than just crossing the red board upside down. Yeah. You actually have to think, well, I've got to stop the car. I've got to, you know, <laughs> the procedural aspect I think could be more realistic for the yeah. people that really want to go to town on on the realism factor. But I think we uh, so, discussed a few ideas of like a dream was it a dream rally game in our previous podcast, and that was one of them we mentioned. I think some sort of uh, something at least shows you the the road aspect between the stages because because yeah. I think a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate or understand that okay the stage is finished, but then you have to 
spend hours of your day going to the next stage and and yeah. it has to be on time otherwise you get penalties yeah. and then you have to switch your brain on and off between the two and it's quite a big challenge part of the aspect of rallying yeah. i mean one thing i have enjoyed about this the latest dirt one is is the the length of the stages you know the longer stages and you're not necessarily learning learning them all all the time and that makes the pace notes more important and i think pace notes can be improved on that's for sure. Uh, it's uh, it's quite frustrating to you know the, when you first get the game, you go off in the same corner for the first seven or eight times you go round. <laughs> you know, that's that one again. Yeah, uh, it's, it's it's the learning aspect of it that that takes the time and yeah, and also I think on the pace notes, obviously I think you would fair to say you'd have more detailed notes than in in a game, but the game also has to try and strike a balance between accessible to those who maybe aren't yeah. rally drivers. Yeah, so, so maybe the in the future they need to have like two modes or two sets of notes for each stage. I don't know. Yeah, it's the consistency of them, I think, as well. You can you can take one corner like a four left flat, and sometimes it's, it's handbrake job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's that it's that sort of thing that from a from a driver's point of view, you want you want to be consistent, and maybe yeah. even the option to change them. I don't know how it works, but yeah, some sort of. Options. In-game recce or something—I don't know. That would be that would yeah. be really cool. But I also yeah. imagine the programming on that would be very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's not my problem. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> that's, that's their job. <laughs> but yeah, so, I know, I know. It's it's not it's not straightforward, is it? I, was, I genuinely think we'll see over the next few years further advancements as well, and then it'll be good to see how things compare. You know, as technology improves. Yeah. Um, how was competing in some of the dirt rally clubs over the past year? Did you have a good time? I believe you had like even like a heart rate monitor for some of the EBRC stuff. Is I did, correct? yeah. I think I did. I did. Uh, I can't. I can't remember the outcome of that, but I remember that the EBRC ones. I was nervous throughout the run. Right. Wow. It. You know, you get wound up about it. It's a bit, bit of a hype and all the rest of it. But in a real rally car, when you hear go, you know, you might be really. You know, I do get really nervous, and but as soon as you hear go at the first stage all that completely goes it's like it is literally like a switch but on the on the on the esports stuff the nerves seem to stay with me throughout the whole the whole stage it's quite it's quite strange how that level yeah. of intensity remains with you even though you're concentrating on something else but i think that's again because of the you're not having the sensations through your body and there isn't the risk that you, your mind has still got that capacity to be nervous whereas when you're in the real rally car Everything has to go into to driving that car because there is that risk. So I think that yeah. the, the the element of risk is replaced by the nerves being retained on the game. So. Yeah, maybe the nerves are masks in in real life, but yeah, the front and center in the esports world. I, I also believe you did uh, some work with your sponsor Yasa Batteries, doing your own esports competition earlier this year. Is it also a good way of um, engaging with the community and the fans? I think it is. Yeah, um, you know, we had we had a good couple of hundred people involved with that as well that was that was good and the winner of that came to um we had a photo competition and a winner of one of the the championship came to a test day with us and they had a really good day and had a ride in the car and were able to feel again see the similarities but actually to feel the car off the start line was like you know getting thumped back in the seat and those are the things that it misses unless you've got one of the the big rigs which yeah to the mere mortal are a bit inaccessible you know the cost of those things they are at the minute yeah comical, so- but- do you, do you mind me asking what your current setup is? Are you on PC or a console? Or? PC, yeah. Uh, it's like a, I've got a, a metal frame rig with a nice. partial bucket seat on it, curved monitor, gaming monitor, um, Fanatec, uh, Club Sport, pedals Lovely. and wheel, and nice. the gear leaving handbrake. So it, it's a nice it's a nice setup. It, it feels yeah. nice, and it's but it's not it's not 20 grand of it, that's for sure. Oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. It's mid, mid-level. mid I suppose it's still serious, and uh, you're not um, just on your gamepad or controller, no, which is, no, which is it, interesting. No, it, it, I, I always, I bought the game with uh, with this same PC a good number of years ago now, so. Right. But, you know, Dirt Rally 1, Dirt, the first the first incarnation of it, um, that's when I first got the rig to play. Like, a mate of mine got I the see. game, and so I kind of followed suit when, when I could, and... Uh, it takes up a fair percentage of my flat. That's for yes, sure. yeah, I know. It's uh, it, it's like, oh yeah, I'll get one of these rigs. Uh, you buy it, you put it all together. You're like, oh, hang on, a minute. where yeah, yeah. where where's it gonna go? Yeah. Uh, so so we're we're speaking just before on the eve or just a couple of days before the Jersey E Rally. Um, you're seeded fourth. Are you happy with that? <laughs> that's news to me. 
<laughs> breaking news. Who's put me there? <laughs> so there's some serious esports talent in and around you. <laughs> Are you going to uh, keep up with them? Do you think there might no, be some former world not champions? A <laughs> not a chance. I'm going to have to get some practice in. Yeah, you've got two days. I think. Uh, I mean, it could be worse. I'm seeded 147th, so I mean. That... <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm actually going to watch the the uh, Roger Albert Clark rally. So I'm as soon as we as soon as we finish here, I'm up north. Uh, okay. To go and have a look at that uh, for two days. So uh, sleeping in the car, usual rally bubble hat stuff. So uh, nice. We make two days, and then Saturday I've got the kids for the day. So it'll only be Saturday night when they're in bed that that'll be getting uh, some some battering and that, that sounds like a. A really elaborate excuse to me. I wrote the book of excuses, so I can I can I can give you another one if you like. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I mean, I haven't uh, played the game for a long time either, so I think um, I'm just going to aim to get through the stages and not retire. That, that's my that's my plan. That I take, is, I take is the that is the worst excuse in the book. <laughs> just get through the stages. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, as soon as it start, as soon as uh, you start going, then all of a sudden the race face comes on, right? And then you start yeah, focusing a bit, red, and then you're a bit pushing a bit too hard, and then a Hinkelstein, and you're like, oh no! <laughs> I take it you'll be taking part in your uh, in a in a polo. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, we've got nice, we've got the US livery on the polo as well, so that's, ah, cool. that's quite cool. And uh, people might be able to watch you streaming live, maybe. I believe so. There's a bit of technology and stuff <laughs> work out before that cool. <laughs> this is the thing I, I i can do the the driving thing but all this online streaming technology stuff is whole new world to me i'm gonna i'm gonna need somebody to hold my hand to get that set up sunday afternoon right well uh this podcast is releasing after the jersey rally just to uh, lift the lid on everything so you may or may not have seen matt streaming live but either way we both took part in the jersey e-rally and um if you weren't able to get involved, just search Jersey E Rally on Facebook because uh, fundraising for the RNLI Jersey and Teenage Cancer Trust Trust is still ongoing, and we'll also put links in the description to this podcast as well because it's a couple of great causes and a great great initiative, I think. So, uh, well, congratulations again on your British Rally Championship. Matt. Best of luck with the Jersey E Rally. But also, I just want to quickly ask before we go: Are you working on plans for 2022 already? Would you like to do some rallies outside of the UK, maybe in Europe, or, or what, uh, what, what are you I, aiming I, for? I, I'd love to. Um, getting outside the British Championship, as much as I love it, has been a goal for a long time. You know, there's a lot of the people I've competed against in the British Championship have done a lot of rallying abroad, which, you know, for budget reasons, I've not been able to do. So it, it's always been a case of budget rather than the, the enthusiasm to go abroad. That's for sure. I, I, I'd love the opportunity to go and do you know, a couple of World Championship rallies or ERC or, you know, even Irish Tarmac. But um, at the moment, it's it, we need to just sort of reset and see who's who's still on board and who wants to join. There's there's always opportunities to get involved with what we're doing. We're a great team to be part of, and you know we're, we're always ambitious on going to do things. And I'm still as keen as ever to to go and do more. It's just it's just a case of finding that that elusive budget and to go and do it. It's uh, it's hard work. It's a full time job on its own, really. Yeah, always a challenge, and I can't. Imagine how much effort goes into trying to find and secure the uh, loyal sponsors that, that help you to go rallying. Yeah. So we wish you the best of luck with your plans for 2022 and, of course, the Jersey E-Rally. And congratulations on your third British Rally Championship. Uh, for everybody listening, let us know in the comments below if you've been taking part in any Dirt Rally or WRC game clubs and what you'd like to see from Rally Sims in the future. But for now, keep it pinned.